Hello, or should I say, hello? It's the Mythbusters Halloween special, and we are testing the story currently that there is a certain frequency of sound too low for the human ear to hear that can still make people feel uneasy and lead them to believe that a place is haunted. We've set up four identical houses, but only one of them will be getting the suboral sound treatment. I am sitting on that treatment. This is a stack of 40,000 watts of speakers that will produce a sound that most people can't hear. Will it make them feel like this house is haunted? <laughs> I really don't know. Well, you're about to find out as the first set of our 10 volunteers has arrived for a very strange meet and greet. Howdy. We've got uh, 130 cabins up here. He is, although something about him seems strangely familiar. You're gonna look at four of them. And one of those four, something bad happened. Now, we'd like to know if you're sensitive enough to tell us which one. Thank you. With everything set, Adam and Jamie retire to Haunted Hum HQ to watch the test. Ah. Let's find out what they actually think. Shall we unleash the contestants on our fear parade? One at a time. OK. <laughs> Let's bring out the first contestant. And that first contestant is Tiffany, who heads to cabin number one. Yes, we're staring at you. We're all staring at you. <laughs> How do you like that? Where she sits silently for three minutes until Adam gives the command to move to cabin two. Three, two. <laughs> it's like a remote control toy. Switching to feed number two. And then after another three minute sit, she moves on to cabin number three. Switching to feed number three. Confirm for me that the sound's on? I found it on. Good work, thank you. As far as Tiffany is concerned, it's the sound of silence. But does the subaural sound wave induce fear? 15 seconds. Let's try to get a weird back in this room. Well, it certainly seems like she's noticed something. And after a final three minutes behind door number four, the question is, which cabin will she pick? <laughs> If you had to pick one of these four cabins as the spookiest, which one would you pick? Two. Two. Can you say why? Do you know why? It just it just felt weird. Felt a little lightheaded when I walked in, but, but it, just, oh. it just felt really weird. Tiffany wasn't weirded out by the sound, but she's just the start, as each volunteer is klaxoned through the cabins. So, which house? Two. I'd have to say it'd be one. Number one. Yeah. All right. Excellent. But so far, their intuition isn't picking the freaky frequency in cabin number three. Maybe number one was probably the one that I felt was a little bit more tense than the rest. None of the volunteers seem to know why they picked their cabin. But at the halfway mark, it's clear it's not down to the hump. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the cabins in the woods, it feels like something bad happened. <laughs> it didn't. But the Mythbusters are testing if a freaky frequency can persuade their volunteers it did. Which one felt the spookiest? Two. So far, none of the volunteers have picked cabin three and its haunted 19 hertz hum. But it seems as though candidate six is slightly spooked. He just said I get the weirdest feeling it's kind of freaky. Which house do you think was haunted? If I had to pick one, it'd probably be cabin three, I think. What was it about it that caught your attention? I don't know. Um, just the way that the, that the flooring looked and everything inside there, maybe walking around inside there, feeling it. Felt a little, little different, though, yeah. One volunteer sensed the sound. But will that trend continue into the final four? So your final choice is? Three. Number three. Yeah. So that's two strikes for cabin three. But as the test continues, um, I guess maybe it would have to be one. I felt the most uncomfortable in the first one. When I first walked in there, I felt nervous and uneasy, and I think my heart rate felt up. Number one is still number one on the spooky chart. I would say number one. Fantastic. 
And that, it seems, is the final nail in the coffin for this frequency of fear. 10 tests, 10 test subjects, and I think we can definitively state that cabin three, the sound we put through it, did not make it the spookiest cabin. If anything, cabin one was the spookiest cabin. Cabin four, the least spooky. Now, this could be because of one of two reasons. Either because we had everyone enter the cabins in numerical order, the newness of the experiment and the weirdness of sitting alone in a room for two minutes made them the most frightened at the beginning and the least frightened at the end. The other reason is that cabin one could actually be haunted, but I don't think so. How do you want to call this one? Well, number three didn't get a higher score than any of the others, so. I guess the tone didn't spook anybody. 19 hertz was definitely not the sound of fear. What is that over there? Oh! This way! Characters in horror movies have a nose for trouble. But does that trouble have a nose? Is there really a detectable scent of fear? After their close encounters of the creepy kind, the Mythbusters have some seriously scared sweat samples. But before they test them on human noses, they're giving them to a mechanical nose or the gas chromatography machine. Now, if there is some sort of chemical difference between our fear sweat and non-fear sweat samples, this machine should be able to identify them in the parts per billion range. Yep, and after sniffing out the exact chemical composition of both samples, it's looking good. All right, Steve, what are the results of our tests? Well, we've seen differences in both the fear and non-fear sweat examples in each of your tests. Really? Really. There's pretty good indicators that there's a difference from fear. Well, good, that's great for our myth. I mean, now that we know that there might be a chemical difference, let's see if it can be smelled. Absolutely, because although the machine can smell the difference, to confirm this myth, the human nose must detect it too. All right, you guys, come on in. I promise I won't bite. Grant might. So, for our smell of fear experiment, it'll be double blind, meaning neither the volunteers nor Tori, who's administering the test, will know what sample is what. Now, each volunteer will be given two jars, A and a B. There are four possibilities. Either A has the fear, B has the fear, they both have the fear, or neither has fear in it. What will happen is they'll mark down the results and at the end we'll tally everything and see how they did. It's a methodology that should leave no nose unturned and ensure a definitive result on whether the smell of fear can be detected. One by one, the secretion sniffers are brought in. Take a nice deep breath. Now, according to the gas chromatography, there is a discernible difference between samples. It's kind of weird to be smelling another man's sweat, huh? Yes, it is. But is that a difference that the human nose can detect? And like an olfactory factory line, the test runs smoothly, and the volunteers nose out that aroma of anxiety.